cabrón ya. ¿Listo? Hello, my fellow Sara Eco friends. I am delighted to be the last presenter of this Sara E Fest. Um, I hope you are enjoying uh, all the presentations. I will be talking to you about knots today. Um, what I will do is to portray an historical view of knot theory. I will start with the point of view when they were presented as the basic building blocks of matter and it was important for them to be able to classify knots because according to the properties that knots have, we will have the properties that matter would have. Later on they found that knots are not a good model for physical theory, at least not until recently, but anyway the question of classifying knots remained a very important one and remains to be the most important one actually because we have not been able to answer the question when is the knot actually the unknot. What we will do in this short video is to watch me suffering with computations trying to compute several invariants that are attached to knots. With that I hope you convince you that to compute these invariants and to define these invariants is not trivial at all. But also I want to portray the beautifulness that this subject has because this, it is very creative. All the things that we can see, all the mathematical properties that we can talk about them, we can actually see them. And we should take advantage of that because, well, knots live in three dimensions and we can see three dimensions, so we will see knots. And after that, after you see me suffering and after you see me experimenting, I hope I will have you convinced that knot theory is not only beautiful, but it's, on, it's also a subject that deserves to be studied in more depth and that all of its mysteries remain to be discovered. Remember, we did it for the knots. In the 1860s, there were two opposing theories describing the behavior of matter. On the one hand, we have the corpuscular theory in which we consider ma matter to be composed of small building blocks. On the other hand, we consider matter to be a superposition of waves. Lord Kelvin proposed a middle ground between those two theories. He proposed that the building blocks of matter were going to be little knots. So, as knots traveled through space, they conveyed to matter its properties. Hence, now as we have a classification of the building blocks of matters, now we know they are atoms and we classify them according to its properties in the periodic table, at that time it was fundamental to classify the building blocks that were proposed and hence it becomes fundamental to classify knots. The way in which they tried to classify knots was to obtain a representation of the particular knot in the plane. They would take a knot and they would look at its shadow and they would make a drawing of its shadow and by looking to the shadows they would try to classify them by finding distinct properties that they could decide, distinguish between one knot or the other and the other way around. If you had several knots represented in the plane, you would like to convey properties from what you see in the plane to the real, actual knot. So now I present you three distinct knots. As you can see from these knots, these are real knots created from these strings. Uh, at the moment we have no way to know if these knots are actually the on knot or no, we don't really know how knotted they are, or we cannot even know if some of them are more knotted than the other just by what we can see of them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick this one now, I'm going to put it on this white sheet of paper, and I'm going to draw the planar representation as we might do it in, in reality, that is in mathematical theory, what we would do is to hold the knot like in space and do what I'm gonna do but since I cannot hold it so I'm gonna do and so let's suppose so what we do is we will follow the knot and the idea is to follow 
and we will be very careful on respecting which note goes above which one. So for example here, in this crossing, this knot that I already draw goes below, so we have to be careful with that. But in this one, the one that I'm drawing is the one that goes above. Oops, there we go. So here, the one I'm drawing goes above. As you can see, this is not easy. Here, like this. This one goes below and it does something like this, but this one goes above and uh, as you can see, I already got lost this like this so I believe I managed to do it this one goes above, this one goes below okay, so one way to, to, to see if you are done with it is like counting the crossing number which is important, it's like one crossing, two crossing, three crossings four, five crossings, so in our drawing we have one, two, three, four, five crossings so, um, this is a disaster, um, it can return here, oops. And now we have, uh, uh, let me correct this, oops, there we are. So now this is a planar representation. As you can see in the planar representation, we can see which string goes above and which string goes below. So this is the way in which from an actual knot we would get a planar representation. Or we could go the other way around, I can present you several planar representations. This is the planar representation of the unknot, this is the trefoil, um, well these ones do not have a name. And what we will do now, we will pick one, for example uh, this one, and we will follow, and we will create the string with this uh, green string, we will follow it and I hope this is not a disaster, so we start somewhere um, we go, we go, we follow the string we follow the string until it crosses itself again and actually this way of doing knots that I am doing right now was one of the first ways to classify knots I'm not gonna talk about that right now, but since I'm doing this the way in which we do, for example here we have a crossing but the one that I am drawing right now goes above now, but now it goes below, so I do it below and as I was saying, there was a way to represent knots by strings of numbers and signs in which you would keep track of exactly what I'm doing here that's the way Gauss did this, but as I already said, I'm not talking about this it's just for you to not get annoyed so this one goes below this one is here, so this one goes above, this one goes below and now we are here, so now we make, <laughs> how ironic, now we make a little knot. Ah, fuck it. There we are. And so, um, this knot, this little green knot, this one, are the same knot. This is a planar representation of the actual not that if I had more hands I could grasp in three space more uh, fancy. Once we have planar representations to represent knots, the next question that is in order is to ask whether we can determine from two planar representations if the knots that are being represented are the same or not. The first person who gave a way to answer this question was Kurt Reidmaster. What he did was to define a set of three operations that we will see in a moment and he proved that these operations are enough to take one particular representation of a knot into any other planar representations of the same knot. Hence, Right, master's theorem states that two actual knots in three space are the same if and only if their planar representations can be taken one to the other by performing these operations. Sadly, this is not enough in order for us to answer the questions if 
a not is actually the on not because what you want to do when you want to answer this question is to diminish the number of crossings but by performing these operations sometimes you would have to increase the number of crossings before that very number decreases hence there is no algorithm based on this that actually is efficient nevertheless it will be through right master movements that we will be able to study and define polynomial invariance because it will give us a very particular set of operations that we will need to study to define these things instead of studying the whole knot as a whole. The right master moves are movements that occur within the neighborhood of a crossing. And the idea is that you will change the shape of the knot only locally without changing what happens away from that neighborhood. Now I present to you the three right master moves. The first right master move is something that looks like this. So remember this is just a neighborhood of the knot and what we will do is to disappear a loop so the knot starts like this, and now the loop is not there. If you see, we have destroyed one crossing. The second right the master moves is to pull one string above another string when they are not really tangled. So here we have, for example, this purple one goes above the blue one. So we can pull the purple one and the blue one apart, and now there are no crossings. The third right master moves moves one string that goes above a cross and it pulls it and it puts it in the other side. So as you can see, what happens in each one of these cases is that you are changing the nature of the knots, but only locally. Now we have a particular example of a planar representation of a knot. Now we will change this knot only locally performing a particular right master move. If you notice, in this neighborhood of the knot, we have the second right master movement. And so we can actually perform it and change the representation. And now we have another planar representation of the same knot. So right master theorem states that all planar representations of the same knot can be taken one to the other by performing a finite sequence of these three Rydemeister movements. Now we finally come to the part in which we will define a polynomial invariant. These invariants are polynomials that are attached two planar representations of knots, and its main property is that when you have two distinct planar representations of a knot, you will compute the same polynomial. It's very important to notice that the other way around is not true. You may compute the same polynomial, but that doesn't mean that the knots that are being represented by that planar representation is actually the same. Uh, there are a lot of polynomial invariants that can be computed and defined in this way, but we will only have chance to do one of them that is called a Conway polynomial. This Conway polynomial will be easy to compute according to three distinct rules that I will explain in a second. But in order to understand these rules, we need to define three operations that will be defined on the knots. But opposite to write the master movements in which the knot remains to be the same, these operations will actually change the nature of the knots. Okay, uh, previously I said that there were three movements, uh, I was wrong, there were two movements. Okay, I will explain the first movement, it is called the flip. Uh, the name comes from the fact that what we will do is to change the strand that goes above. So what I will do is, remember this is a neighborhood of the knot, so I cut, uh, go, and we tie the knot but the other way around. So we have changed the knot that goes above. The second one is called smoothing because the idea is that we will remove this crossing. We will cut both strands and we will tie them. If you realize, we could tie them like this or we could tie them like this. I will just do one of them. If 
if you realize we have removed the crossing. Uh, for all other computation that we will do, we will always think that the knot is oriented, that means that we have a way in which we move along the knot, and that will give us a particular unique way to do the smoothing procedure. Now it's very important that we know that these movements can change the nature of the knot, so I will explain this with the trefoil. We have here the trefoil, and I will look to this crossing, so firstly I will do the flip, so I will cross, I will cut this one, Oops. and I tie now below, and well what has happened is that the trefoil has become the on knot, so the nature actually changed. Now I will create a smoothing one. I will cut both. Oops. Okay, this is one. And this is the other one. This one goes with this one. Some orientation. And this one goes with this one. See, this is not as easy. So in this case, we obtain the odd knot again. Uh, if I were to do the, the same thing, but with the other orientation, instead of obtaining the odd knot, what we will obtain was a link, something like this. To each kind of representation of a knot, we will attach a polynomial, lambda knot, that satisfies the following three properties. Invariance, that means that if two planar representations are equivalent, then they have the same polynomial. Normalization, this polynomial attached to the one knot that we represent like a circle is equal to one. And the scheme relation that says the following. What this means is the following. We have here three planar representations, n plus, n minus, and n zero. And this means that there are three knots that outside these yellow neighborhoods that I am drawing are exactly the same. And the way these neighborhoods change is the following. Here we have this. Here we have this. If you realize what we have done here is the flip. And here we have the smoothing. So these are the ways in which these polynomials behave. In order to test the strength of this invariant, I present you three knots. The trefoil, the eight knot, and the stevedore knot. What we will do is to compute the value of the Conway polynomial in each one of these knots and compare them between them. So let's see whether these knots are equivalent or not. So we're going to compute the Conway polynomial of the trefoil knot with the given orientations as marked with the arrows and we will look in the neighborhood of the crossing that is here in this yellow neighborhood. So what we will do is to use the scale relation several times to obtain the polynomial. So if we realize in this neighborhood we have precisely this term of the scale relation. So our knot is k minus and we will see what are the other knots? So remember what happens is that in the neighborhoods is where the change occurs and outside the neighborhoods the knots are exactly the same. So this one is the trefoil. Here we have changed the crossing with the flip and uh, I don't know if you can see from the drawing but it's a good exercise with imagination. You have the on knot. And here what we have is a link have a link like this. We also have this orientation. So the equation that we have to solve is the following one. We have to obtain that equation is the knot is one minus x. The equation of the link that I will call L. So the link we we'll look at it. Its uh, orientation is orientation. Let's say this one. 
there it is, it is a link, we will look at this, this crossing and we will obtain a similar scheme relationship so again so in the smoothing what we obtain here is outside the link they are like this Our link is here. Crossing uh, outside. Outside. Here the the crossing changed. So here we have this. So this is the link L. You realize this is like two distinct circles, and this one is the on not. So the polynomial we want is this one. This one we know. So we need to find now the Conway polynomial of two circles that are not knotted. So we have this thing. And the trick here is to Consider this like the smoothing of another knot. So in our equation we will have something that is like this. Here we have this thing. This is the neighborhood. Outside, we are going to create crossings now. This is the smoothing. So, what will happen is we will join one end with an end of the other circle. In one situation, this one goes above, and in the other is the other one around. And if you realize what we obtain in each case is the on not. So, we are subtracting 1 minus 1, which gives us 0, which implies that the polynomial of the double trivial knot is 0. So we obtain this. And this is good because now we can return to our equation. If you if we see this thing, this one will be zero. And so the polynomial we wanted is minus L is equal to x because this one is one. And so in our equation what we have is the following. We have that the Conway polynomial of the triple is 1 minus x times this one, which is minus x, which is 1 plus x squared. Now I will compute the Conway polynomial of the Stevel or not, but I do not know the answer, so I will ask my director to put it inside this red envelope and then when I'm done with the computations we will see if I got it right or wrong.
finally, after so much work, I've been able to compute the Conway polynomial of the Stevedore's knot, or that's what I hope at least. So now we will see if I got the right answer. What do you think happened, Malors? I'm sure this is right because I recognize this. This looks. <laughs> I'm sorry. This looks like a penis. But uh, this is the eight knot. So I recognize this one. So when I got this, I knew this one was correct. So I, I thought I got it, but I'm supposed to have a minus. So that minus must come from here, which means that I computed wrong the. I got the polynomial here. I, I did something wrong. Hmm. My heart is broken. Okay, I, I found my mistake. It was precisely a problem here. If you realize S0 is like this, this is correct. And I made this, this crossing here is supposed to be this crossing, at least in my mind. But if if you realize I copied it incorrectly. This one, the one that goes in this direction, is above, and here I draw it below. So these two nodes are uh, like the, they are knotted in the opposite direction. So that, that changes the sign. So doing that would change the position of these two. My, the, the real node should be in the position of the positive one, and not in the position of the negative one that is the one that introduced a sign. So the mistake was not a computational mistake, it was a mistake of, of making a bad drawing. <laughs> okay. Okay, so first we computed the Conway polynomial of the trefoil and we found it to be 1 plus x squared. Then we computed the stevedore's knot, which we found it to be 1 minus 2x squared, which are, is distinct, they are distinct, so we know that the trefoil and the stevedore knots are not the same. But actually, uh, as a byproduct of all these computations, as, as I said, uh, this is the 8 knot, the 8 knot, this knot and this knot are the same, and we found that the Conway polynomial is x squared plus 1, actually, which is the same one as the trefoil. So the 8 knot is not uh, equivalent to the Stevedore knots, but uh, we do not know if it's equivalent or not to the uh, trefoil because they have the same Conway polynomial, so this polynomial does not detect their difference. Or not. So far, we've seen that the stevedore knot is not equivalent to the trifold knot, nor to the eight knot, but we have not been able to see whether these two knots are equivalent to each other. So in order to have a stronger invariance, what we are going to do is to imagine a knot, in this case the eight knot, traveling in a space like this. It always remains being the eight knot, but suddenly, imagine that the strings come very close to each other, very close to each other, and suddenly it will change its nature. Now it is not knotted anymore, this is a trivial knot, and it continued traveling, and suddenly again the strings come very close to each other, very close to each other, and then again it is knotted. So if you can see here, this is the trefoil knot. It looks similar to the eight knot, but it is not. It has changed the nature. And so it can continue traveling, traveling, and again the strings can come very close to each other until again we have a trivial knot. So by allowing the knot to cross itself, 
we can change the nature of the knot. And this idea was precisely the idea of Basiliev that we are going to understand now. We are used to the idea that singularities are hard to study, and that may be true, but they are also useful. And Viktor Vasiliev introduced the idea of a singular knot precisely by allowing singularities in the knots. Hence, as we have been using, we can have knots that do not cross each other. Oh. There, we have the. Okay, forget it. But this is a regular knot. But now, as we saw in the previous. Uh, experiment, we can allow knots that cross each other at a particular time. This kind of knot is not a kind of knot we are used to work with, but we can consider them and we will call them singular knots. And this would be singular knots of one crossing, singular knots of two crossings, etc. And we care about singular knots of a finite number of crossings. And we will put all of these knots together and we will denote the space of knots in this way by F and we will classify it in the following way. By allowing each time more and more crossing, so we have the regular knots, the knots with one crossing, the knots with two crossings, etc., etc. Crossings of this way, when one string is over the other. And the idea is the following. F will look something like this. This is F, this is the space of all knots. And this is not precisely correct, but the geometric idea is the following, is we have that the regular knots look like this, the yellow part, and the red part is what is called a discriminant and consists of the knots that have at least one crossing. And if we go inside the red area we will see something Again, we will see things, but now the white area consists of knots with one crossing and the red one consists of knots with at least two crossings, etc, etc. And understanding how a knot moves in this space as a geometric path will allow us to define invariants that will be stronger than the Conway or other type of polynomial invariants. So now we have a map of the singular knots. The red lines are the discriminant, that is the singular knots that have at least one double point. And now we will follow the path that the eight, that the eight knot goes by so we start with the 8th knot, and as the strings start moving one to each other, we eventually have a double point, that's when we are in the discriminant, and we have changed the nature of the knot, and now we are at a trivial knot. And then we continue moving, that means that the strings are moving in space, until again they become very close to each other, until suddenly we have crossed uh, the discriminant, we have changed the nature again, and now we are in a zone where the knot has become a trifoil. And now the strings continue moving, we approach the discriminant, we have a double point, and now again we have become a trivial knot. We have a trivial knot, and now we can continue traveling until it looks like a familiar or not. We have seen that this space of singular knots is divided by the discriminant, in this case the red lines, in several regions, and each region represents 
um, the distinct positions that the same node can have in space because you cannot change the nature of a knot without crossing over each over its own strings. So now we will use this geometry in order to define the variance. So for example, this region here is the trifold region. All the nodes here are the distinct ways in which the trifold can be inside space. Here we have the eighth region. And this big area here is like a trivial region. All the knots there are trivial. So in order to make this uh, simpler, I will erase the knots, but now we know how are the knots there that are represented. So all, everything here is a trifoil. Everything here is a, a knot. Everything here is an eight. And we know that here, 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 there are other knots. We don't know which ones, but there are other knots. And what we will do is to give an orientation. Uh, this can be done rigorously. We will, not, we will not do it here, but we will give an orientation according to these arrows. So we will say that we are crossing in the positive orientation if we cross in the direction of the arrow. And we will define an invariant by claiming that it has value 0 in the trivial sum. So we will call this invariant B, and B of the unknown will be 0. And the rule will be that it will increase by 1 each time we cross the discriminant in the positive direction, and it decreases by 1 when it crosses the discriminant in the negative direction. So let's follow the path. So this is a trivial knot. And we move here, and so it remains being 0. But now we have crossed the discriminant in the positive direction, so in the trifoil, we have value 1. And now we continue. We cross the discriminant in the negative direction, so we return to 0. And we continue, 0, 0, 0. And now we cross the discriminant in the negative direction, so it decreases by 1. So it is minus 1. Hence, we have seen that the value of this invariant the trifold is 1, and the value of this invariant in the 8, in the 8 knot, is minus 1. We have not really defined this invariant, but believe me that there is an invariant that actually does this. So if we actually have that invariant, this invariant will be strong enough to distinguish between these two that the Conway polynomial could not do. But an important thing is that, of course, this invariant must be invariant under distinct paths. So just for uh, another example, let's go from the trivial knot to the 8, but now in this direction. So now we will go inside two knots that we do not know which knots they are. But let's see what happens. So here we go. Here we are in the trivial zone, so invariant 0. We come here, positive direction, so this is plus 1. So now we go here, negative direction, so we go 0. And now negative direction, and so we arrive to the same thing, minus 1. So this kind of invariance that take into account this nature of the geometric structure of the singular nodes are the Basiliev invariants. And they are very important because they take into account the singularities that we have, and we can have several singularities, not only one, and because of that we can take into account a deeper structure of the knots. We have finally reached the end of our talk, in which I will finally state the principal conjecture of this topic. For that I will define what is a Basilio Dubarian. It's a very simple definition. It's a function that goes from the singular knot to R that satisfies the skin relation. So, in the neighborhood of a singular point, we have the following. So, remember, this drawing means that these are neighborhoods of crossings, and outside the neighborhoods, the knots look the same. If you remember in our previous drawing, 
this is exactly what is meant when we say that crossing the boundaries we increase or decrease the value of the invariant. It is exactly what this equation means. And the Basinger invariants are stratified in the following spaces. The invariants that vanish on singular nodes of n plus one or more double points. This is a very useful way to stratify the space of Basilev invariants, and actually the challenge is to understand these spaces. The first space, B0, is actually R, and B1 is actually R again. So the first space where we have a non-constant invariant is B2. And an example of such invariant is the quadratic term of the Conway polynomial that is a Basilev invariant of degree 2. Actually, the end term of the Conway polynomial, when it is extended to all singular nodes, is a Basilev invariant of degree n. And the conjecture is the following. Basilev invariant are complete. That means that we have two nodes that are not equivalent. There must be a Basilev invariant that distinguish among them. And remember, don't let no one to tell you otherwise, do topology, do it for the nuts. <laughs>